emergency? for months, even years, and not hear anything about Lorenzo Wright, and then all of a sudden it's back front and center, and, and we're thinking about it and talking about it again. I guess it's kind of like Elvis's death. I was police director when Elvis died, and I still to this day get calls about things that happened during that period of time. I've seen a lot of strange cases. This is a strange one, though. in Memphis, Tennessee, Lorenzo Wright was the embodiment of a hometown hero. A local high school basketball star, he chose to play college ball for the hometown Tigers at the University of Memphis, where he propelled himself into the NBA. The Los Angeles Clippers select Lorenzo Wright from the University of Memphis. No one says that this guy doesn't give it to you night in and night out. kid made it big. In turn, he became a local celebrity. Hello, I'm Lorenzo Wright of the Memphis Grizzlies, and I'm going to show you how I'm living here in Memphis, Tennessee. He also became a pillar for the community, volunteering his time and wealth to the city that helped raise him. Memphis loved him. He returned the embrace. First thing they would say, how good of a person he was. It was more about that than it was about him being a ball player. He was always giving back and very good with children. In 2009, after playing 14 seasons and earning more than $55 million in contracts, Wright's NBA career was over, but he was anxious to continue playing overseas, mostly in order to support his six kids. One father, and as a son, you couldn't ask for more. You know, you just don't find people like him every day. Mike Ryle, Deputy Chief over Investigative Services with the City of Memphis, Tennessee Police Department. Been involved with the Lorenzen Wright investigation since 2010 when I was a major over violent crimes during that time. He was kind of an icon here, very well known in the community. People still talk fondly of him, still remember him. It's unfortunate that he was tragically killed in the town that he loved. And he spent the day catching up with friends and was last seen that night at his ex-wife's house, where he left before midnight. And then mysteriously, uh, uh, contact was lost. His mom called me, uh, and she was like, hey, Dennis, I can't find Ren. Uh, I'm like, what do you mean you can't find him? And I called everybody that I can think of. And I told her, I think it better be safe than sorry for us to file a missing person report. Collierville police are trying to find any information that can help them find Lorenzen Wright. And so far, there's been no luck with leads. A year before that, he had kind of disappeared. He went to Europe. When he got back, I said, where you been, man? He said, oh, I just got away for a while. I was still holding out that, you know, he was in Europe somewhere. But after it got to be four or five days, everybody began to wonder, wow, what's going on here, you know? Did something happen to him? And then it got to be seven, eight days, and it just seemed, you know, there were no answers. Police do not suspect foul play in Lorenzen's disappearance. His mother just wants to know her oldest son is okay. We just called us and say that I'm okay. Wherever he is, just call and say I'm okay. So 
Sources tell Fox 13 that the body found in the wooded area off Hacks Cross and Winchester is Lorenzen Wright. You talking about nine days in a field in July and it rained? You know what that does to a body? By the time police found him, his 611 body decomposed to weigh only 57 pounds. He'd been shot at least five times. Those nine days put investigators at a huge disadvantage, one they couldn't control, and that began even before Wright was murdered. About five minutes after midnight on July 19th, 911 dispatch office in, in Germantown, a suburb here, gets a 911 call. that the case had from the very beginning because that night that call was not tracked the way that it should have been even though they got the latitude and longitude from that call they were trying to use basically an iphone to find where it was at the best they could place that spot of where the call came from was outside the jurisdiction of germantown and so at that point they just let it go they didn't turn it over to patrol to investigate as time went by, seven, eight, nine days, they eventually did that. They used the cell tower information to pinpoint where it came from, got cadaver dogs, and found him in short order. And that's why he was not found for nine days. That was inexcusable. Anybody will tell you, a television show, First 48, solving a murder, you really want to be on top of it immediately. They didn't have a whole lot to work with as far as the murder scene was concerned. Investigators were also left wondering why Wright's body was found off a road so remote, locals tell ghost stories about it. He had to know that whatever was coming down, it wasn't going to be pleasant. Did they tie him up and take him out there? Did they say, hey, we're going to go down here and build a campfire? It's a strange, strange case. Solving Wright's murder proved difficult for a police department struggling to control one of the more dangerous cities in the country. Do we have crime? Absolutely. We have those small percentages of persons who want to be involved in gang activities and illegal things. They can it's rough for a parent to have a kid leave this earth before them. He lost his daughter to sudden infant death. And that that tore him up. That that was really tough on him. And it wasn't until he left that I realized just how deeply that hurt goes to lose your your child. With little forensic evidence and no official suspects, police have been desperate for leads. Even with a $21,000 reward for tips, Crime Stoppers has received few calls. Got a total of 48 tips. 28 were something that was worth looking at. None of those panned out. Certainly not arrest or the issuance of an arrest warrant. I mean, it's pretty cold here in Memphis. I can tell you that. It's, I mean, everybody's lips tight. Lips tight because they don't know. Lips tight because they're scared. Lips tight because they know better. Until somebody actually starts sharing information and talking. And I'm not talking about this information, but I think. 
talking about their theories. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about a hypothesis. I'm talking about facts. His murder was a message. Don't do this or this will happen to you. There were two to three men who were unknown to her who came with guns. Drug dealer connected to the Mexican cartels. We're talking about millions of dollars. I told her to call the police. All I wanted her to do was tell the police what she told me. Usually what's done in the dark come to the light. I just wanted to walk in his, his last step. That's all I wanted to do. Feel what he felt. Maybe he could have told me something right then and there because he know I always been with him. Uh -uh. I wish they had killed him in my front yard. They just had to kill him. At least I could have had him a decent funeral. after Lorenz and Wright disappeared, and nine days after he placed a 911 call that echoed with 11 gunshots in the background, Wright's decomposed 57-pound body was found in a remote woodland area of southeast Memphis. Everyone wanted to know how this hometown hero could be murdered just miles from where he lived. He got along with everybody. He was, in a way, the wind blow was him was cool. He didn't like confrontations, you know, so in a way the wind blew was cool with him. Every person that I met that I didn't know, they would come to me and the first thing they would say how good of a person he was. It was more about that than it was about him being a ball player. But there was another side to write, a darker B side, so to speak. His tens of millions from his 13-year NBA career were gone a product of his extravagant spending. I think when you're as tall as I am, you need a really big bath to... Houses were being foreclosed and checks were bouncing. By 2008, Wright was in a financial hole. He needed help, and so he turned to a childhood friend whose quick solution for Wright was to sell his personal cars to a guy named Bobby Cole, a car enthusiast and high-ranking member of a Memphis-based drug organization run by notorious kingpin Craig Pettis. Craig Pettis is a very big deal drug dealer here who was connected to the Mexican cartels. He was very, very high in the narcotics trade. Lorenzen sold cars to Bobby Cole and by all appearances hid those cars in Lorenzen's name in what is known as a nominee ownership uh, scheme you know, a drug dealer like Cole gets his money through illegal gain, and he can't display that illicit wealth openly. He's got to hide it. And what happened was the federal prosecutors here, in an offshoot of prosecuting the Petty's organization, filed a asset seizure case against a Cadillac Escalade and a Mercedes-Benz that were titled and registered in the name of Lorenz and Wright. Lorenzen was talked to by the government then. He denied any knowledge of Cole getting these cars in any illegal manner. Wright told federal agents that although he did sell the cars to Cole, he had no knowledge of the car's purpose or existence of drugs. Cole eventually pled guilty to a single count of narcotics conspiracy. Since that moment, Wright's mother believes that Cole had a vendetta against her son. I told the police goes right back to the cars. See, and that's why they was mad at him, because to say this, this is my car, that's your drugs, too. You finna do some time. So Lorenzo wasn't going to do that. You know, to leave that house that night, something was going on.
one, where's your margin? Oh, oh, Wright's questionable past extended beyond his relationships with Petty's drug organization. Investigators soon learned of two mysterious men carrying weapons looking for Wright and his family members in the weeks before Wright's death. There's the uh, statements of his ex-wife, Shara, who told police there were two to three men who were unknown to her who came with uh, guns. Evidently, they had these guns tucked in their waistbands, knocking on her door, looking for Lorenz. When she told me that, I told her to call the police. All I wanted her to do was tell the police what she told me. These gunmen also supposedly went and talked to one of her sons at school. They also went to Herbright's car dealership. Some guys ran into his dad's car lot. He never told the police about them running into his car lot, but I told him. This was two weeks before they killed him. Like, warning, you better get him, you know, he better come on. But Wright never did leave. And on the night he was murdered, his ex-wife, Shara Wright Robinson, told police in an affidavit that around 10.30 p.m., Wright left her house with up to $100,000 in cash and a box of drugs. He was there on a track phone, which is basically a disposable type phone, that prepaid phone that is hard to trace. Drug, drug dealers like to use them. And the rest of her story was that he then left with somebody she didn't know, and that was the last anyone ever saw of him. So she places him by that statement that she gave to police in a drug connection. I think there are a lot of arguments for the idea that he was killed in some kind of drug or debt scenario because of where he was found in a remote location in the field. There were shell casings of different calibers which suggest multiple gunmen. Starting on 911, where's your emergency? They knew that he got on the phone and called 911. I mean, whoever did it probably thought they had to get out of there in a hurry. My personal opinion has been all along that he owed a lot of money to the wrong people and that his murder was a message that if you owe us money, you better pay us. And I think, quite frankly, the reason we haven't gotten any substantive tip was because the people that killed Lorenzo Wright probably th flew in here from who knows where, Mexico City, wherever, uh, called to meet him to collect the money. He didn't have all the money. They killed him and got on the plane and left. So I think the reason we haven't gotten any tips is that nobody really knows. I know it would have to be a heartless and gutless person to do something like that. He usually was done in the dark, come to the light. You know, that's what I'm holding out on. Somebody know. One day, it'll come out. the police department and told them Lorenzen was here at my house. He didn't leave the house and had not know what kind of car vehicle he got him. Never. There was also that insurance policy that he had, the one million dollar policy that she benefited from. She should never been given that money. Ten months later, a million dollars was gone. Living with Lorenzen you have to learn how to not automatically be offended by somebody. You have to learn how to assess what's being said. And in Lorenzen's death in that case, through my research, the wife or the husband or the significant other, they're always the one that they want to find answers from first. Did you have any part in Lorenzen's murder?
Meshara, Lorenzen's deceit, abuse, and infidelity were threads in their marriage. After six kids and 13 years together, the Wrights divorced in February of 2010. Although he moved to Atlanta, Wright still made frequent trips back to Memphis to see both Shara and the kids. He arrived for his final visit on July 18th, just hours before he was murdered. When police learned that Shara was the last known person to see him, they attempted to question her. Initially, she remained quiet behind a lawyer, but after nine days, she spoke to authorities on the phone. There's the uh, statements of his ex-wife, Shara, uh, who told police, it's in the police affidavit that they used to search her home after his body was found that Lorenzen was here at my house, you know, a couple hours before he disappeared, and uh, he had a box of drugs with him and a large sum of money. He was talking over that time that he was there on a track phone. He then left with somebody she didn't know, and that was the last anyone ever saw of him. Due to a technical issue with the dispatch office, police weren't provided that 911 call until nine days into their investigation. That's around the same time Shara explained the details of that night. Details that, according to authorities, changed since her initial statement. I couldn't give you an exact time, but it was over into the um, evening. And I don't know who he left with because I was half asleep. There was no box of drugs. And if there was, then I had no knowledge of that. Um, that was insinuated and that was created for, I guess, certain purposes. But box of drugs did not come out of Cheryl Wright's mouth then and it won't come out now. In some corners, Cheryl's reluctance to talk to police and her changing statements have led to more questions than answers. You always have kind of amateur investigators out there who say, you know, why aren't they looking at his wife? She's an obvious suspect. I know that, uh, that they questioned his wife extensively in this thing. That is still part of the uh, pending investigation uh, with the open file that we have, and I'm not able to comment on any, anything that we're doing in, in reference to that investigation. And then there was this. Neighbors say that they told police they saw Shara using her fire pit with an unknown man on a 95-degree summer afternoon, only days after Wright disappeared. Police eventually searched the house. They left with burnt metal from her fire pit. Shara's attorney at the time also claimed that in the weeks prior to Lorenzen's murder, Shara was approached by hitmen asking of Wright's whereabouts. I don't remember what their attire exactly was, but the information about that was given to the police for their investigation, which is still an open investigation, so you do understand that we can't discuss that. Then there's Wendy Wilson, who claims that she was Wright's assistant. Wilson asserts that in 2003, she received multiple voicemails from Shara threatening Lorenzen's life if she caught him cheating. I went to Memphis police because it concerned them at the time to say make a report. Her conversation was all over the place, but at the same time, there were underlying threats. Wilson claims that she turned the voicemails over to police back then, but she doesn't currently have copies. I felt that she was capable of acting on threats that she made on several occasions. If someone says something once or twice, you just figure, oh, it's just an anger. They'll make up, they'll get over it. But it, it just got from bad to worse. She was affiliated or associated with a radio station. I talked to her a couple of times. She identified herself as his personal assistant. And she never personally assisted him or I with anything. Well, I work for him, and uh, I have proof that I work for him. I have checks. I've submitted that to the authorities and police. And then there was money. Wright struggled financially in his final year, jobless, with mounting child support, and foreclosed homes. But five months before his death, Wright took out a $1 million life insurance policy during the divorce. 
It was part of a permanent parenting plan for his six kids. And on July 1st, 2011, Wright's kids were set to inherit the $1 million. As I recall, in, in somewhere in the, in the time frame of about 10 months, she spent almost all of that $1 million. There are indications of frivolous spending. There were you know, some luxury cars bought. There was a very expensive trip to New York for a couple of days. But then, too, she bought a house and did some renovation to the tune of something like $350,000. How I take care of my children, that's nobody's business but mine and Lauren's. And then he had it outlined how he wanted them to be taken care of, and that's what I've done. Unsolved murders are hardly uncommon. According to the FBI, the national clearance rate is roughly 64%. But a victim of this stature within these circumstances is what makes this case so striking. The when and where are clear. It's the who and why that seem to be a long way from being established. We've had leads as far as uh, up to 2015, up to this year, uh, that we're pursuing. My goal is before I leave the Memphis Police Department, I want to see uh, Deborah Marion get some closure. And the only way she's going to get some closure is for us to find out who, who killed her son. Barring someone talking for whatever reason, deathbed confession, uh, whatever it might be, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't think any physical evidence is going to come forth that's going to solve this case. Until this investigation, Shara had remained largely quiet about Wright's death. Information had been limited to a police affidavit and a couple of local interviews. She admits being aware of the rumors and gossip that rocket around Memphis. Still, her public comments haven't always extinguished speculation. Did you have any part in Lorenzo's murder? I met mean, first I'm um, a wife, then I'm a mother. And then thirdly, I'm an author. The law enforcement should do what's best to find out who's the killer. Can you understand, obviously, why I had to ask that? I do, but I'm a wife, a mother, and an author. I, I let people do what, what they're good at doing, and I'm just going to do what I'm good at doing. Um, they need to spend time and focus and find out what happened to him. We all need to know. Shara has since remarried, recently moved to Houston, become a minister, and wrote a self-help novel for abused women based loosely on her marriage to a basketball star. Meanwhile, back in Memphis, Lorenz and Wright's parents still struggle, each in their own way. I have a six foot ten poster on my wall. I see him every morning when I pass by. You know, he will always be that age, you know, look just like that, you know, in our mind and hearts. I see a day coming the good Lord gonna tell me to just let them do what they gotta do. I see him put me in slow motion. You let somebody else take the driver's seat, but I'm gonna be on the back seat close as I can be. Cause it, it, it ain't over. But one of these days, hopefully before I die, they're going to get them.